Welcome everyone to this special joint event with the South Georgia Heritage Trust and the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust. We're looking forward to an interesting evening learning all about research on orca in the Southern Ocean. There's going to be an opportunity for you to ask questions of our two speakers after their presentations. And we'll also be highlighting just a few of the fabulous lots from our online charity auction afterwards you'll get a chance to participate in when it goes live and we'll let you know the link to join and how to bid. Now I'm going to hand over to Camilla to introduce the presenters. Well, thank you so much, Alison. It's great to see you and great to be here and great to welcome uh, so many people in the audience. I can see um, you're sharing where you're from, which is, uh, so keep going. We want to, want to hear from you. Um, delighted to be here tonight. Um, it's going to be a really interesting night, I think, um, where we're going to be meeting two extraordinary uh, experts in whales, orca, cetaceans, whatever you want to call them, um, and uh, the, each are going to give a, a talk, a short talk, and then we'll have loads of time to ask some questions. So please get your questions ready um, and we will we'll make a start. So I'd love to introduce um, Jared Towers, who is a researcher, author and captain. <laughs> Jared, do you, do you want to give us a little bit about, about yourself? Sure. Yeah, thanks, Camilla. Um, well, I'm, I'm Jared Towers. I'm here in Alert Bay, British Columbia, also known as home of the killer whale in this small community and traditional territory of the Nandis First Nation. Um, yeah, I, I started looking at killer whales as a kid. There's a lot of killer whales in this area and spent uh, most of, of my summers uh, with them every day since I was about six years old. So naturally went on to, to study killer whales and have worked with the species in six oceans. Um, and uh, and that's what I continue to do here when I'm at home as well, uh, is uh, we do a lot of uh, census work on the on the populations that live here. So, um, yeah, I'm really pleased to be here tonight and thank you for having me. Not at all. That's great. Great to meet. And where, where are you right now? Are you in Canada? I am. I'm at home in, uh, well, I'm in my office here in, uh, in Alert Bay, British Columbia, Canada. Yes. Excellent. Well, it's great to have you with us. So we've got about 10, 15 minutes um, to hear what you have to tell us about the the great orca in um, in the southern oceans so i'll let you take it away thank you okay. so much and uh, yeah. yeah here's jared towers well i'll just uh share my screen here and give me a moment now can you see this okay uh, can you see this okay camilla I, I presume you can, and uh, you might let me know if if you can't, but um, I'll just carry on here. Um, so this talk is going to be about killer whales in the furious 50s. Um, this is a part of the world that I've, I've worked in a fair bit on a few different expeditions. And uh, these latitudes in the southern hemisphere are named the furious 50s because um, there's consistent gale force, storm force, and, and hurricane force winds that blow at these latitudes for days, weeks, and months at a time. So the early sailors and explorers in these areas referred to these waters as furious 50s. Um, it's a great place for killer whales to live, but um, it's quite hard to find them there. And so we, we spend a lot of time, you know, at sea in, in this part of the world. And when we do find black dorsal fins, um, there's uh, several different kinds of killer whales that these can belong to. And I'll just give you a brief overview of some of them in this latitude. Uh, there's type A killer whales that, that live in these waters. These are a regular looking kind of killer whale. Um, jet black, and white, you know, regular sized eye patches. And uh, these are also referred to as regular killer whales in, in these waters. Um, and we also have type B killer whales. Uh, they're very similar to type C killer whales and broken down into type B1s and B2s, depending on where they are and what they're doing and how they look. But uh, in general, this killer whale is characterized by uh, having a dorsal cape, relatively large, large eye patch and a blunt rostrum. And uh, there's also type D killer whales in these latitudes. And because they're so hard to work in, it's really hard to, uh, to get to know much about any of these killer whales in the furious 50s. And you can see how um, different they, uh, they each look. Um, and these illustrations are provided by uh, Ryan Chadwick uh, in the UK, 
who uh, is a wonderful cetacean bird and uh, insect uh, scientific illustrator. Uh, check him out on Instagram if you get a chance. Uh, one thing that these different kinds of killer whales all have in common is that they all love toothfish. And uh, so a great opportunity for someone who wants to learn more about them is to uh, collect data from the Patagonian toothfish boat, which these whales are attracted to. And this uh, video it might be a little bit shaky for you, but this is a, an underwater uh, look at just what happens when these fishermen are pulling in their fishing lines. Uh, the killer whales often show up and just steal the fish right off of them. These are uh, regular type A like killer whales from Crozet uh, Indian Ocean area. But um, working uh, anywhere in this region, you can see that there's quite a bit of toothfish being caught. Um, South Georgia, uh, Argentina, Chile, Kerguelen, uh, Macquarie, and they all have killer whale problems. And uh, so as uh, someone who wants to learn a bit more about these animals, I was deployed on a Patagonian toothfish longliner in 2015 off South Georgia. Um, their fishing season is in the Austral winter. And um, so the conditions are quite challenging. There's icebergs around, limited visibility. Um, during the six weeks I was at sea, we had um, an average wind speed of about 40 knots. So this is a, quite a, a common scene from that trip. And of course we had killer whales um, on, on many occasions. And there hadn't been much uh, work done specifically on killer whales in South Georgia um, prior to this. And uh, so I was able to um, get a look at them as they came in. And, and typically when we're pulling in a, a long line, uh, the x-axis on the bottom is, is showing the kilometers of line. And uh, the catch might fluctuate a bit um, naturally or because you have a few sperm whales around. But as soon as those killer whales show up and they travel in groups of 20 or more, um, the catch just completely disappears as they strip the line. So this provides an excellent opportunity for some photo identification research. Um, a lot of the work I've been involved with, especially here in Canada, is, is uh, photo identification research because each one of these groups of killer whales has a number of individuals that all look differently. And uh, so I was able to catalog um, four different uh, families or pods and, uh, and combined with some of the other data collected from fisheries observers in this, uh, in this fishery in South Georgia over the years, um, both prior and after the time that I was there, uh, we were able to find just about 50 decent quality encounters where I could uh, make IDs from the photos that were provided. And what we found is that after 2015, that discovery curve just, just plateaued, indicating that there's really only about 70 killer whales uh, at South Georgia responsible for all the Patagonian toothfish stealing going on. And these individuals are seen over and over again in this area. That's their home and, and that's what they like to eat. Um, now to get an idea of movements, uh, I was able to put one tag out on one female. And amazingly, of all the killer whales that have been tagged in different parts of the world, um, this killer whale behaved differently than, than any other. Um, we found that uh, this killer whale followed the vessel, which was not surprising, but even when we tried to get away from her and her pod, um, we managed to get sometimes almost 200 kilometers away from them. And then they'd, they'd find us a few days later. You can see that in the top part of this graph. And what they especially love to do is as soon as we started hauling that line, they'd, they'd scream in and, uh, and then they'd all disappear as they made these extremely long dives. And this killer whale in particular happened to dive deeper, much deeper than any other killer whale uh, that has ever been tagged before. And um, these dives likely represent the physiological limits of, of this species because she was diving on some occasions while stealing fish over a thousand meters. And, uh, and so that was quite remarkable. Um, one of the reasons why this might happen is because a lot of the time when, when fishermen see killer whales, they stop fishing right away. And so they've only got a limited amount of time to take as many fish as possible. And these dives were happening all in less than 12 minutes. So she was traveling very fast down to the bottom and back. Um, now, another expedition I was, I was more recently on was, um, again, uh, focused on an area where there's Patagonian toothfish longlining. And we knew from the longliners off Cape Horn, Chile, that uh, there were some type D killer whales there stealing their fish. And so 
on a whim, we, we managed to get on a 70 foot sailboat and, and um, yeah, perhaps unsurprisingly, it was impossible to work there um, for almost the first two weeks of the trip. Um, we had storm force and hurricane force winds and we got stuck out in them and had to sail around the horn backwards back to the safety of the anchorage. And on our last day, um, we managed to get out there in probably the most uncomfortable seas I've ever been in. And we found uh, these, these killer whales. Um, and, you know, it, it seemed like because the conditions were so bad and we can only really see a couple hundred meters and we we're in the middle of nowhere, no other boats around, um, quite a ways offshore, it, it felt more like these killer whales found us. And as soon as we put a fishing line in the water, um, they all came right over to us and they, they had to know what was on the end of that line. Um, keep in mind that these whales make part of their living by um, checking out boats and stealing fish from them. So uh, we were surprised by this, but when we thought about it, it, it made sense. Now, another thing, of course, we were able to get to collect some photo identification data um, and add it to the other photo identification data of individuals from this population, um, or at least the type of killer whale that have been taken around the Southern Hemisphere. Um, yes, some of these whales we knew from previous encounters, uh, mostly from fishing vessels in the area, and that um, the group that we saw really was the only group that had ever been seen stealing fish from fishing boats in that area, and it was about 27 individuals. And so after our trip in 2019, that uh, discovery curve plateaued for Chile. Um, every time there's type D killer whales photographed in other parts of the ocean, though, um, they tend to be new individuals, which is good news. So just to wrap up, um, you know, part of that trip was to collect some uh, genetic data for the first time on this type of killer whale because they look so differently. The thought was that they must be a, a different species of animal altogether. And, um, and maybe again, unsurprisingly, uh, it did turn out that um, they are quite different genetically. So in, in just um, 13 years, we've gone from um, making the first description of this kind of killer whale um, back in 2010 um, to actually knowing a bit about its genetic evolution. And um, one of the key findings of this most recent study based on genetic data was that these killer whales are um, the most inbred um, type of mammal on the planet. Um, so well, we've come a long ways in a short time just because uh, there's a few folks like me and some colleagues who are able to get out there and um, work in some, some pretty hostile conditions from time to time. But um, uh, that's uh, that's part of the adventure and the excitement of this kind of work. So with that, I'll, I'll just thank you for being here today. And um, thanks to the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust and the South Georgia Heritage Trust for hosting this event. If you have any questions, um, we can chat um, after Lee's presentation, which is up next. Thank you. Fantastic, Jared, that's fascinating. And some real, really interesting nuggets in there, which I think we look forward to exploring a bit more. But um, yeah, and some really remarkable footage and images you, you have there. So what an amazing job you have. <laughs> yeah, it's it never a dull moment. No, I'll bet, I'll bet. Thank you so, so much. We're going to, um, please, um, audience, think up your questions and do post them in the chat and we'll compile them from there. But um, next up is Lee Hickmott. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Lee. Hello there. You tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, Camilla. Hi. <clears throat> I'm a whale biologist. I'm based in Petersfield in Hampshire in the south of the UK. And uh, I've been studying cetaceans for about 25 years. Um, predominantly a group of whales called beaked whales, a, a large family of cetaceans, but also killer whales. Um, starting out in the Pacific Northwest with a chap called Ken Balcom at the Centre for Whale Research. And, and uh, then in the Around 2016 is when I first started going to Antarctica and I've been fortunate enough to visit there every year since. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to <clears throat> supporting um, both your charities this evening and uh, and hope that everyone um, enjoys the talk and, uh, and then goes on to uh, bid well <laughs> and all the items in yes. the auction later yes. on. <laughs> Fantastic. And wonderful to see you sporting love the beautiful Antarctic tartan there on your tie. So, oh, so. thank you very much. Yeah, yes. Marvellous. Good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Well, Lee, thank you. I mean, uh, I think um, you've also been involved in filming, haven't you? Um, and the Frozen Planet series and that sort of thing. So looking forward to maybe hearing a bit more about that, exploring a bit more about that as well. But um, for now, I'm going to hand over to you um, to tell us all about your experience of Orca in the Southern Oceans. 
Over to you, Ray. Thanks very much. Uh, so one of our colleagues in, in the back is going to help me out here in terms of moving through our slides, looking at some videos. So do excuse the, um, the odd comment where I have to move along with the slides. But um, yeah, I'd just like to begin in a way by saying, well, you know, why do we study killer whales in Antarctica? You know, it's a great privilege to go to the white continent, but, um, you know, why do we do it? And what's the benefit of that? And, and it's really because we're interested in the role that top predators play in ecosystems. And then we're able to use them as indicators um, to the health and the dynamics of Antarctic food webs. And um, killer whales typically are, are apex predators and at the top of food chains. So by getting an understanding of how they're doing and how their populations are faring, um, it gives us a sense of how the whole ecosystem and the food webs beneath them are doing. If we can move along, please. So I just wanted to really start by saying that getting to Antarctica or to South Georgia, for example, is incredibly difficult. Um, as Jared mentioned in his talk, you know, terrible seas, high winds, a lot. Um, and so it's a real difficult place to get to, both financially and logistically. And so in order to, for example, take these images that you can see around um, the two other ship images of us making our way through Drake Passage, um, I just wanted to acknowledge particularly John Durbin and Holly Fernback, who are my colleagues who introduced me to working uh, with Antarctic killer whales and all the other collaborators that we have, which also includes hundreds of citizen scientists, probably many of um, our audience here may have been there and may have submitted photographs um, to various um, platforms that we have to collect data on killer whales and other species of cetacean down in Antarctica. So I just wanted to give um, a shout out to all those people because without them, um, there's no way people like myself would be able to get down there and conduct the research that we've been doing. We can move ahead, please. So as Jared mentioned, there are a number of different ecotypes. Um, essentially, we can consider them different species of killer whales that, that uh, inhabit the Southern Ocean. And I'm going to talk mostly about the three that you can see on the left there. I, I work down around the Antarctic Peninsula or Graham Land. So in that central map, you can see that uh, red rectangle. And it's, it's the three types of killer whale on the left that I have the chance to predominantly work with. As Jad mentioned, type A, that classic black and white killer whale look. And then the two B forms, B1 and B2, who have this dorsal cape, a yellowish hue, which is from diatoms, which grow on their skin, and then a large eye patch. And then there are two other forms. Um, Jared has, has mentioned those, but we're going to focus on the A's and the B's here. We can move on, please. And with that, I wanted to, to just really reiterate um, how, as we are talking about the Southern Ocean and, and Antarctica and South Georgia, that these killer whales really move through all of the Southern Ocean. So this is a, a map that, that the central part is, is Antarctica there, and then the heat of the of the oceans around and then the continents around them. And those black lines that you can see are actually migration routes of different ecotypes of killer whales. And these killer whales, um, well, killer whales themselves are relatively small whales compared to things like blue whales and fin whales. And so they pay quite a high price for going to Antarctica where food is abundant, but the temperature of the water is very cold. So it, it's averaging around minus two degrees centigrade. And so what these animals are having to do because they're relatively small is, is shut down their outer skin, their epidermis. And that means that it gets covered in diatoms and potentially other harmful bacteria. So throughout the year, they'll make what are called maintenance migrations. So our colleagues, John Durbin and Bob Pittman, they put tags on these animals, the same tags that Jared was referring to, and found that these animals move away from Antarctica, making round trip migrations of up to around 11,000 kilometers. So huge distances up to subtropical waters off Brazil, Uruguay, that sort of latitude. They go up, they shunt blood to their outer skin. It's like going to the spa. Then they shed their outer skin and they make a beeline straight back to Antarctica, uh, ready to continue foraging. And, and as we understand it, they're not feeding on these migrations. They're literally going up, going to the spa, shedding all that scuzzy skin that's acquired um, 
over their time in those really frigid waters and then head back south again in order to start feeding and foraging again. If we can move on, please. So I mentioned that there are these three forms that we see around the peninsula. And here are three drone images um, from a paper that my colleagues and I published, giving you a clear indication of not only how they look in terms of their color differences, you can see the cape on the two animals in the center and on the right, the, the B1 and the B2 killer whales, and then the stark black and white image of the type A killer whale on the left. And in these photogrammetry measurements that we take, so it's basically by taking photographs from above and measuring the individual animals, we're able to not only see that they look different, but they're actually different sizes. So those type A's, the males can reach up to nine meters in length. The B1s, that central animal, they're up to around eight meters in length. And then the B2s are the smallest of those three around the peninsula, just over six meters in length. But you'll also notice not only are they different in their length, but also in their girth. And if you look at that central image of that B1, just how fat and girthy that animal looks. If we can move along, please. In terms of the, the A's and the B2s, so around the peninsula, the, the type A, that classic black and white looking killer whale, they're predominantly foraging on minke whales and southern elephant seals. And then the B2s, that smallest form, well, they're often seen chasing, interacting, tossing, as in this picture, and consuming penguins. But their predominant diet is some sort of mesopelagic fish or squid. And so mesopelagic means the body of water between 200 and 1,000 meters depth. And again, colleagues, by putting tags on these animals, we've been able to find that they're making regular dives throughout the day and night to foraging depths of between two and 700 meters. So although we do see them actively catching penguins at the surface, the majority of their diet is some deeper water fish and or squid species. And we'll jump along, please. So the rest of the talk, I'm mostly going to focus on the, the ecotypal species in a way of um, Antarctic killer whale that I have had the fortune to study the most, and that's the B1 or pack ice killer whale. And here you can, it's just really to iterate um, that cape that they have, that large um, eye patch that they have, which are able to use along with their dorsal fin to identify individuals. And you'll see in a lot of these images how we're seeing the heads of these animals as they spy hop and search. And we'll come to that later because they're very dynamic at the surface in terms of their foraging and their hunting strategies. We'll move along, please. So as the name suggests, these are pack ice killer whales, and, and that's because they live in amongst the pack ice. So the pack ice is the, the frozen sea. So as, as the Antarctic um, winter takes hold and the sea freezes as, and spreads, as spring comes, that fast ice, that frozen sea starts to break up. And that's then considered pack ice. And it's that pack ice habitat that these killer whales have evolved to specialize living and foraging in. And so that's the habitat that we have to, to make it to. And so we very typically have to head south of 67 um, latitude. So we're going pretty far south um, to encounter these animals. And as you can see in that central picture, it's pretty difficult to get our sailboat or our vessel through. Often it looks absolutely impenetrable and yet a killer whale's head or its fin will pop up somewhere and they'll breeze through this habitat. So it can be very challenging for us, but they may easily cover a hundred miles in a day. And, and even if we do find them, we can easily lose them. If we can move ahead, please. In this really stunning and beautiful pack ice habitat. So most of our time is spent with binoculars glued to our eyes, desperately searching for either the fins of these animals or as they spy hop, uh, which is when they raise their part of their, their head and, and part of their body out of the water to look for prey. And so when we're there, as I say, we're mostly searching continually. And if we're not finding the animal, animals themselves, we're looking for their prey. If we can find their prey, it's possible we can find the killer whales themselves. We can move on, please. So in terms of their prey, the animals on the right, essentially 
all killer whale prey or seal prey for these B1 pack ice girls, if you think of them as very cute sausages, essentially. So the animals on the right, those are all Weddell seals, and that is by far the preferred prey of pack ice killer whales. But they do also at times take crab eater seals, which are the two animals at the top left, and very occasionally leopard seals, which is another big predatory animal of Antarctica, but absolutely no match for killer whales if they wish to take them on. And the two images at the bottom left, those are leopard seals there. So we can move on, please. So these pack ice killer whales are, are really unique and they have a really complex hunting strategy. And that is known for being wave washing. And so if we can begin the first video, please. And so this video that we're about to see um, was during an exhibition I made with the BBC for Frozen Planet 2. And so here, sometimes when the seals are on large pieces of ice and the killer whales want to see what type of seal they are, they make a subsurface wave that will ripple through the piece of pack in order to shatter it, as you saw in that piece of footage. And then what the killer whales will do is move under the ice and blow bubbles to push the ice apart. So then they can take their head up through and spy hop and have a really good look at what type of seal it is. As I mentioned, their real preference is for Weddell seals. So they want to spy hop and have a really good look to see what type of seal it is. If it's their preferred prey, they'll start to perhaps move the piece of ice as they are here, coordinating themselves within the group to push the ice into more open water. After which they'll then line up and swim fast at the, at, at the piece of ice, raising their bodies close to the surface to create a wave that will then wash over the seal and push it into the water. And they may do that repeatedly in order to tire the seal. As you see in these other images here, that's the killer whales having a really good look at their potential lunch um, and then making these large breaking waves over the seal to wash it into the water. We can move on, please. So as part of their strategy, they're incredibly clever, but they're also very cautious about how they handle their prey. They really want to avoid the teeth of the seal and the claws that are on the foreflippers of the seal. So you'll see in this next clip that we're about to begin um, that what they want to do is take hold of the hind flippers of the seal, because once they get hold of them, they'll be able to pull the seal down and then dispatch the seal. So they'll play this careful dance of trying to take it and allow the seal start to climb out of the water, at which point they can grab hold of those hind flippers and take it down and either drown the seal or dispatch it. When they do so, they do quite literally. Oh, if we can just jump back, please. They do. Thank you. Um, they do literally butcher their sea so their their prey. So that image on the top right is actually the pelt of a Weddell seal after these killer whales have essentially peeled it. Now, considering they have no hands, no thumbs, and they're doing all of this careful work by collaborating collaborating together and using their teeth to to unstitch basically the innards of the seal from its pelt, leave the pelt and consume the inside. But also what we see as soon as there is a kill are the other species that get to benefit from these killer whales. And we talked about them being apex predators and food webs and food chains. So as soon as there is a kill, we see these other species like um, brown skewers, Wilson storm petrels and giant petrels all coming to that site where they can then take food for themselves and feed their chicks. We can move on, please. So I mentioned that their preferred prey are Weddell seals, but sometimes they take on other types of seal as well. And both um, crab eater seals, which is the, the image, the largest image you see here, um, and leopard seals are far more agile than Weddell seals. They have a lot more muscular uh, muscle mass in their shoulders, and they're more agile in the water as well. So if we can play the next clip. Um, we'll see some evidence of that. And what that, the implications of, of that for these killer whales is that if they do take on some of these other types of prey, it can be that they don't always uh, make a successful kill. So with Weddell seals, their success rate of hunting is over 90%, one of the most successful predators on the planet. But when they're taking on these crab eater seals like this particular hunt or leopard seals, very often there's a chance that the seals being so much more agile will escape, as you'll see this 
Seal just make it to safety here. And that has implications for these animals that we'll touch on with regard to climate change. And on, on that image on the right, the bottom right there, that's a leopard seal that the killer whales are taking. Just they're taking its final breath before um, they dispatched it. And that was only the first time that it's actually been videoed and documented. And we were able to capture it during that Frozen Planet 2 sequence, which is, uh, which is a real privilege to be part of. We can move on, please. So I mentioned about taking on these different types of prey and the success of taking the different types of seal. And, and really, I do want to highlight that, that, that given climate change and the issues that are happening to the Antarctic Peninsula, um, that there really are testing times ahead. Um, we're seeing the breakup of the pack ice far more quickly and earlier in the season. We're having periods where we should have fast ice, so the sea, ice, the sea should freeze in the winter and doesn't, or is far thinner and breaks up more quickly. And we're also seeing the retreat of glacial ice around the peninsula. And what that means is more beaches are being exposed. And Weddell seals, being the type of seal they are, find it quite hard to get themselves out on the ice and find it far easier to get out onto beaches. And so more regularly, that's where we're finding Weddell seals, the preferred prey of these B1 pack ice killer whales. And that's what these images here show, essentially is Weddell seals that we found, often in large groups, but all completely out of, out of reach for our wave washing killer whales. We can move on. And with that in mind, I just, again, really wanted to reiterate that um, for this incredibly complex animal with probably one of the most um, complex and, and honed hunting skills on the planet, that um, they're, they're, in a, they're in a difficult place. And uh, we, we have to take action now on, on a climate perspective. And so these images show what we do find in the Antarctic summer now. So far more open water, these animals traveling in open water rather than traveling through the pack. And as long lived animals that can live easily to 100 years, um, we're, there's really not clear evidence that they can make rapid changes to their behavior in order to cope with the changes that are happening as quickly as they are on the peninsula. And so the plot that you see here, that's actually the population. And so around the Antarctic Peninsula, there are approximately 100 of these wave washing killer whales. So think of them not as a separate sort of pod, but essentially as a separate sort of species of killer whale. So only around 100 around the peninsula. And we've been able to document that they're declining at about 5% per year. So this is a type of killer whale with an amazing hunting strategy that is in real, uh, in real dire straits and um, really deserves um, uh, a lot of our respect and our help in order to sustain them and uh, the other species around the Antarctic uh, continent. And I'd just like to go to the last slide, really just to say that, as I said at the beginning of the talk, none of the work in Antarctica could be done without a huge collaboration with many different participants, different scientists, collaborators, um, and members of the general public. So thank you very much. Wonderful, Lee. That was that was incredible. Thank you so so much. And uh, what mind blowing actually some of this, isn't it? It's uh, these extraordinary creatures and so sophisticated, aren't they? In their in their hunting strategies and their it, hyper intelligence, seemingly um, how they um, how they survive. But um, really interesting. So can we bring um, Jared back as well, and we'll pick up some questions. <laughs> Hi, Jared. Good to have you back. Thank you. And um, I was just going to—I was going to start off actually because you, you both spoke about feeding um, and hunting, and it was what really struck me was how they adapted their strategies so in such a sophisticated way. So you know, in the for the pack ice um, orca, you're getting these amazing <laughs> techniques of washing seals off off ice floes and things. And then Jared, you were talking about how they're taking fish from fishing lines. And that's, you know, extraordinary adaptation, isn't it? To, you know, fishing hasn't been going on that long in the Antarctic. So, you know, adapting these strategies, I mean, is that something you um you know you you would expect or is this something you're seeing you see across species and across the different types of, of orca that you're that you're studying? Tell me a bit more about about these incredible strategies they have. 
Yeah, I think that one of the most interesting things about killer whales is that they're so highly evolved. You know, they they they're they're on um, you know parallel with us, or even surpassed us in their ability to uh, exploit different environments and also adapt. And um, and other populations, on the other hand, have a very hard time doing that. So there's a lot of variation and diversity, not only in how they look, but also in how they behave, and also how they respond to change. And um, yeah, and and so you're right. You know, they they do have all these different uh, ways of, of feeding themselves and and finding niches in their environments, which which are quite extraordinary. Mm, absolutely, Lee. Any any other comments that? Uh, so- Yeah, I mean, absolutely, I completely agree with Jared. Uh, But also that it's real through cultural transmission that, that, you know, they're highly intelligent, long-lived animals, Mm. you know, with lives very much akin to our own in terms of their longevity, at what age they start to have offspring, um, and the various phases of their life. And a lot of that, um, and the, the intimate nature of their family pods, staying within their within their family units their entire lives means that they pass on a lot of that knowledge there's a lot of knowledge gained by learning from one another that's what we see in the hunting strategies why sometimes when you're watching it can be can you dispatch this seal or particular prey quickly but often the young animals have to learn what's going on so they're incredibly intelligent but they are fixed in their patterns. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that although they have this high intellect, that they're able to change rapidly to adapt to a really rapid changing system, particularly when that system is um, being altered by you know, uh, human impacts as opposed yeah. to a, a natural variation. Yeah, and that sort of gives a gives a sense of hope in that regard. Because your last, you know, your last segment you were talking about, Lee, was that was the impacts of climate change and how you know, they are going to be super vulnerable to changes in the environment. And yet they they have demonstrated such amazing rapid evolution and, and adaptation in their behaviours that may be a cause for hope, I guess. Um, I think we have to have hope, but we also may see that some animals or some pods, some ecotypes of, of these killer whales will make it and others will not. So um, Jared could speak. Uh, a lot more given where he works about, you know, there are pods around the Pacific Northwest there where they are food limited and and that's Mm -hmm. because they eat a particular type of salmon. Um, And we take that salmon and and so we're limiting those pods. So if we can allow the balance of nature to be as it ought to be, and if we can stand back or, or with regard to climate change, it's a challenge, but we can make changes and the sooner we make them, these animals will either bounce back in their cultural traditions that they have or perhaps show some adaptation. But we are at risk that some definitely, yes, they're very intelligent, but we could see some succeed mm. and some fail. Yeah, we give them space. Yeah. Thank you. Right, let's open it up to the um, audience questions, please. So I've got colleagues in the background who are filtering these for us. Uh, brilliant. Here we go. First one from uh, from Gladys. In humans, consanguinity often leads to genetic disorders causing increased infant mortality. How can you ascertain this in a wild, widespread population? So it speaks to what you were talking about, Jared, earlier, <laughs> in terms of the interbred, inter, interbred nature, I guess. Uh, with the type D killer whales. Um, well, you know, as a pertains to that specific kind of killer whale, we, you know, I, nobody really knows. Um, it's, it's tough to get, um, you know, more than a couple sightings a year anywhere in the world of, of that type of killer whale, let alone of, of the same pod, um, perhaps with the exception of that group in Chile, which, which does show up a couple times a year. So that could be a test case. But even then, you know, looking at rates of infant mortality may be impossible because you just don't have high resolution data. Um, now, on the other hand, um, when you're looking at a, a well-known population of killer whales, like southern residents, for example, off of um, you know southern uh, southwest Canada and, and northwest U.S., uh, which are are pretty closely watched year-round, then you can get a sense of of how inbreeding may affect uh, infant mortality rates. But it's it's very difficult to tease those out of other factors and and other risks that these animals face. And, and causes for infant mortality. Um, you know, it, it may be due to uh, some kind of uh, inbreeding, but it, it may be exemplified or exasperated by a limited prey abundance as well. Um, and so there's, there's all these interconnected um, 
factors which which make it make it difficult to say for sure it's one thing or the other. Mm-hmm. And surely, um, you know, impacts of climate change that put additional pressures on a population that a population is so inbred as well. Surely, that's going to, only going to get worse. I guess. Indeed, you know, and when it when it comes to that population in particular, their their main food source um, is impacted by climate change with with warming conditions and the streams and the rivers that those fish need to spawn in. Um, and some of those places where they spawned historically are are now uninhabitable. Um, for certain life stages of those fish. And, and so, yeah, indeed, climate change is impacting the southern residents inadvertently, but, um, but also uh, directly in a sense, because they're so limited in the kind of food that they eat that anything that affects that food is going to affect them. Yeah, indeed. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay, and next question, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, Lee, did you... Did you want to jump in on that? No, no, no. no. Okay, cool. (laughs) Next question then. Okay. Uh, Thanks for this great presentation, says Beth. I'm an exhibition ship naturalist with many, uh, not enough, uh, I think we can all say that, trips to Antarctica, South Georgia. Is there an ID catalogue available for these Southern Ocean orcas? I think there's another question as well about the Happy Whale Project. Is does this, is is there a a way in which that um, sort of citizen sightings of orca can contribute to the, you know, the body of knowledge that we have? Very much so, and they and they absolutely do. So yes, so through Happy Whale and also through um, an organisation called SR3, mm-hmm. that's based up in Seattle, um, that is overseen by Holly Fernbach, and and she oversees um, the um, Southern Hemisphere, well, particularly around the Antarctic Peninsula, the the killer whale catalogues there. So so absolutely, um, the first port of call would be um, Happy Whale. And Jared can jump in uh, if he has other groups <laughs> or where he would like uh, a repository for, for images. But absolutely, lots of the work we do wouldn't be possible without the images that we receive from many hundreds of naturalists and uh, guests that are on board um, expedition ships that are down in Antarctica. Excellent. Yeah, and I, I, I will add to that. Thanks, Lee. I, I think that, you know, especially Happy Whale is, is wonderful because you have access to the, the imagery that others submit. And so... You know, as someone who's curious about a population in a specific area, you might be able to see the sightings records that other people have had of your whale. Um, and, and it's especially popular in the southern hemisphere and around Antarctica. It's, it's quite amazing, that technology. Um, for other killer whale populations, and, and it does apply to the populations in Antarctica if people want to use it eventually, but for a few years, some colleagues and I have been developing some artificial intelligence to help expedite the photo identification Mm -hmm. process from not only identification, but also um, data management and also user ability. So we have a system coming online in just a few weeks after several years of of building it. And it's very population specific. We're starting with some of the populations up here in Canada, but uh, the technology applies to, to any creature with a dorsal fin. And, um, and it's all open source and open access, so everybody can see everyone else's data, but um, the data can only be used for a non-commercial and, and scientific uh, conservation purposes. Fantastic. I'm hoping colleagues can put up the links to some of these uh, for us in the, in the chat as well, so that I would definitely recommend anybody to have a look at the Happy Whale Project. It's, a, it's, a, mm-hmm. it's an amazing resource, isn't it? And you can get lost in it, I think. <laughs> okay, we'll have the next question, please. Here we go. Here we go, Jared. Great talk, Jared. Uh, the prey taking behaviour can only really be as old as the fishery. So evolutionarily relatively new. Do you know what they previously exploited and why or how this might have evolved? I'm not sure, but I, I know that it's evolved in, in every place there are killer whales and fishing boats targeting the same kind of fish that these whales want to eat. Um, sometimes you see an increase in a, in a, a non-targeted prey species like here. We have one part of northern residents targeting a halibut longline uh, fishery, and we know that northern residents primarily eat chinook. So um, it, it can uh, increase their intake of a, a fish species that they might not normally take as much of. But um, when it comes to Patagonian toothfish, you know, I, I think the thinking is that these killer whales that do steal Patagonian toothfish from longliners have probably always tried to eat uh, Patagonian toothfish. And these, these fish have, um, you know, evolved to spend most of their time on the bottom, probably to avoid predation by things like sperm whales and killer whales and seals. But at times, um, they do 
come up into the mesopelagic zone. And they also come to uh, areas like seamounts where they can be more easily accessed by killer whales. So it, it's quite likely that these opportunities just provide easier and uh, easier access to uh, a higher abundance of prey that they would love to be taking um, all the time they probably can't. Yeah, like a fast food restaurant equivalent, I guess. Yeah, and it, you know, and it may be that some of these whales also eat a lot of squid out in these mm -hmm. waters, and we just we just don't know a lot about that at this point. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. much that possibly is unseen, isn't it? I guess. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, great. Lee, anything you wanted to add to, to that one? Uh, no, <laughs> definitely covered it there. And as I was just going to bring up at the end, yeah, that there are other potential prey like squid that given the biomass of squid in the Southern Ocean, that there's the potential that they have a large part of their prey. And mm -hmm. that, again, with a, a clever uh, type of animal, as, as Jared mentioned, you know, around the world, we can see how killer whales exploit different types of fisheries. And uh, so once they, have, once they have the information and they know what to do, as, as we would, yeah. take advantage you know. go for it yeah, yeah indeed <laughs> thank you okay a question here from chloe uh, thanks chloe do the different types of orca have different calls or accents if so would their prey species seals etc recognize an unfamiliar accent as an orca okay um so they absolutely do have different different calls what we call different dialects so they they essentially speak different languages um and they'll have calls that are specific to their pods but also the the types of killer whale um, our knowledge of Antarctic killer whales is relatively limited when it comes to acoustics, but we're working away at that. And um, but absolutely, they do. With regard to mammal-eating killer whales, often when they're foraging, they're silent when they're hunting um, because they don't want to alert their prey to their presence. Now, with pack ice killer whales, often their food is out on the ice so you know it's something that we're moving ahead with in terms of our research to understand how vocal are they and what calls are they using with one another when they want to tell other group members i think i found a seal do they do they have a different call for i think i found a weddell seal versus crab eater seal these are all things that we're chipping away at and if we can identify some of these different calls specifically to to the different ecotypes then then, as I mentioned, for example, I'm only able to work around the peninsula that we can then look at other hydrophone, underwater microphone data from other parts of Antarctica to understand when are these whales there? Are there more there? You know, gain a greater understanding of their population size by using acoustic data as well. So do seals know if it's Weddell seals, if a killer whale, as you saw in those images, gets as close to, the, to a Weddell seal as it does? it never makes it. <laughs> so, so in terms of evolution of, of Weddell seal knowledge uh, of evading predators like pack ice killer whales, um, I think it's probably fair to say, although it's relatively tongue in cheek, that they haven't evolved to do that because when killer whales get that close to them in that scenario, there's only mm. typically one outcome. Um, <laughs> and then those seals can't pass on that knowledge because they've become prey. Yeah, indeed. Professional sausages, as you say. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next question, please. Ah, good one. I do orca uh, hunt Antarctic fur seals as well. Are the great seals of South Georgia. Are these uh, these rich pickings for orca too? Uh, Jared, do you, do you know about South Georgia at all? You know, I, I know that I've seen these Antarctic fur seals swimming with killer whales, um, mostly type B2 killer whales in Antarctica and South Georgia. Um, I've always wondered if type A killer whales will, will take them. I, I presume they do occasionally, but um, I've, I've never seen or, or heard evidence of it. Even in the North uh, Pacific, where we also have a fur seal uh, species, mm -hmm. it's very rare to get any mammal eating killer whales taking them, um, probably because they don't have any blubber or very little blubber because they're insulated by, by fur. Um, an incredible um, fur compared to a lot of other seals. So. Um, are you uh, aware of any uh, cases in the Antarctic League? No. Okay. So, despite, uh, so um, for your, the, um, our guest who, who came up with the question, so as the Antarctic summer moves along, we see more and more fur seals moving down the peninsula mm -hmm. as, as the summer progresses, and they are in high abundance, but mm -hmm. no, none of us have ever 
um, documented them uh, being consumed by killer whales yet. Um, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. They're an interesting creature. <laughs> 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 I think they're like Marmite, uh, fur seals, you know. <laughs> I can imagine they'd put up a fight, actually. <laughs> yeah. like I think you either, you either like them or you sort of dislike them, depending <laughs> on if you have to work with them as a study species or, or how they behave when you're, when you're near them. But um, beautiful creatures, but uh, yes, they have quite the temperament. Yeah, yeah I'll get you a sense of your, uh, your leanings there, Lee. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and also, just to reiterate, you know, as Jared mentioned, you know, m many naturalists and, and guests, when they are on ships down there, you'll see fur seals around killer whales and everybody thinks straight away they're about to see some sort of predation event. And mm -hmm. very typically, it's that if you're in a body of water uh, known as the Gerlash Strait, that um, it's B2 killer whales and they don't eat fur seals and the fur seals are just there messing about, basically making a nuisance of themselves around the killer whales, or, but also <laughs> potentially taking um scraps of prey potentially feces all sorts of different things that we don't really know about but what appears in that initial interaction is oh we're about to see a predation event because there's a killer whale and it's yeah. a seal very often it's absolutely not what's happening but and that's where we need to be careful that we pay attention to what's happening and and see what's going on and and really that's where drone use for example has transformed a lot of our behavioral understanding mm -hmm. of animals because we take a camera from this plane and then have it above the animals and then we're starting to see different interactions that are happening which has absolutely transformed some of what we had known about before or what we've made assumptions about yeah oh, how interesting it's, it's amazing how technology is really transforming how we're understanding the natural world isn't it i think yeah, that's a really good example it's interesting you say that fur seals perhaps you know maybe you know not as um nutritious or you know uh, not worth it but they, they'll but others and a different type is it that take penguins is that right the ones that flip the penguins in the air and catch them like popcorn <laughs> uh, so so those are the b2s so they're the, the, the smaller yeah. form around the smallest form around the peninsula yeah. um, and they're often in large groups you can have groups over 150 animals uh, mm -hmm. sometimes in some of those pods um, and they're doing they're doing relatively okay their population is just over 700 odd animals around mm -hmm. around the peninsula um, so yes if you see wildlife documentaries the appearance would be that they take penguins a lot they certainly do eat them um, and it makes for obviously quite dramatic chase scenes and, and they will even though it's a small piece of prey peel the penguin and they they really want access to the breast muscle those flight muscles that are, are really large on a penguin and, and ultimately that's really what they want they'll take that and and share that between group members and and pretty much leave the rest of the penguin um, but the penguins are playing a relatively small part of their diet given what their uh, nutritional requirements on a daily basis are and mm -hmm. and that's where this deep water diving that that um, jared showed evidence of um, for the killer whales he study and and these b2s around the peninsula as well are mostly getting most of their nutritional uh, or caloric intake from a, a deep water prey species that we're still working on yeah, so uh, yeah, penguins are snacks, I guess. <laughs> yeah, great, great, thank you. Um, next question. Haile, you mentioned that the B1 orca are declining at a rate of 5% a year. Are there currently measures, any measures in place in, or in development to tackle this issue? Difficult one, I guess. Uh, it's a great question, I, and I'd, I'd love to say, yes, there are. I mean, in terms of the, the killer whale scientists that, that work there, um, all the information that is gained goes to um, all the relevant uh, Antarctic Trust uh, or, and, and uh, governments that manage uh, regions of Antarctica. Um, but that decline is most likely as a, as a causative factor is, is climate change. So in terms of doing things to try and benefit those animals, um, IATO, which is the the, the body that um, oversees all the tourism down in Antarctica is taking steps to, to try and um, alter or, or modify how we um, uh, interact with, with killer whales down around the peninsula because of course they're, they're incredible species for people to see, everyone wants to see them but also obviously wants to respect um, how we interact with them down around the peninsula and and a particular area where I work um, off Adelaide Island in the south, um, there's a number of very narrow channels that these animals frequent a lot, particularly because there's a, a high abundance of Weddell seals there. But at times we get um, 
you know, more than a quarter of our 100, let's say, Western Antarctic, we keep it very broad here, of, of that population in that area at any one time. Now, oftentimes, those channels are completely ice locked and so ships can't get through them and you'd have to travel all the way around um, Adelaide Island it's more than a day sail um, mm. to get passage to an area called Marguerite Bay so to get down to uh, well base Y at Horseshoe and and also base E at Stonington uh, if, if any of your um, viewers have, have had the chance to get that way or have desires to get down to those bases um, I it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Whereas when those channels are open, because we're having a, 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 a much greater and faster reduction of pack ice in, in that area, then the ships can pass through. And that potentially has issues to do with acoustic disturbance of those animals. So we are currently taking steps with IATO uh, to modify how um, ships use those channels and how um, animals are interacted with there. So we are trying to take steps. There are mitigation measures with governments but essentially we're we're working with that largest problem that the planet faces which is how do we tackle climate change how do we change what we're doing as a as a population of of the planet to to um you know to get that warming rate down and you know i want to say like we must keep reiterating that the action is needed now but the action that we do take will make a difference and animals absolutely can bounce back. So it's, it's not too late, but action is required immediately. I think that's an amazing place to end, actually. Uh, thank you so much, Lee, Jared. I mean, fascinating. I, I could talk for another hour with you. But, I mean, it's just really fascinating. Um, really, th there are several other questions there. I'm sorry we didn't get around to all of them, but uh, perhaps we can, might try and answer them in the chat later on online. Um, thank you so, both so very, very much. A really, really interesting. Um, I encourage everybody to check out the Happy Whale because I think it's a great resource to have a look at um, these whales. But um, yeah, uh, keep doing what you're doing so well, both of you. This is extraordinary and interesting and important work. So thank you so much. I'm going to hand back to Alison. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, guys. That was absolutely fantastic. And now I want to tell our our viewers that it's over to you guys. Uh, we're going to highlight a few of the lots that you can bid on to help support support conservation work and research in the Antarctic. And you can absolutely see why it's important for us to kind of invest in, in this kind of research that these guys are doing. It's, it's so key to the future of South Georgia and the Antarctic. So let's have a look at some of the, the lots that you can bid on to start making a difference yourselves from your comfort, comfort of your armchairs. Okay, so we've got four lots out of uh, many different wonderful lots that you can bid on after this talk. Uh, the first one I'm going to highlight is a 21-day adventure voyage to South Georgia, the Antarctic and the Falkland Islands. And that has been very kindly donated by G Adventures and it's for two people sharing. Um, so there's loads more information about that on the auction site. Go and check it out. Uh, we've also got a really brilliant 12-day uh, highlights of Antarctica expedition cruise. And that's been very kindly donated by Hurtigruten Expeditions. And that's also for two people sharing. So if you want to go and see for yourself, our auction lots provide you with the opportunity. So get on there. Uh, we've also got a really unique lot, which is the Union flag that was shown on the site at Des Moines base on the Antarctic Peninsula. And that's a unique chance for you to have a little piece of Antarctica in your own home if you bid on that one. And the final lot we're going to highlight is called The Lone Penguin. And it's an oil painting by Beverly Ensley. And Beverly is a professional wildlife oil painter who fell in love with South Georgia and Antarctica. She feels that every animal has its own unique personality. And as you can see, she really beautifully conveys that in her artwork. There's more than 30 other lots, all at different price points, including unique artworks, antiques and collectibles, and a range of fabulous one-off experiences, which you can boast to your friends about. And you can also donate via the auction page 
to help protect South Georgia and Antarctica and support our conservation work. And as an added in incentive to get involved, and with thanks to G Adventures for this, everyone that places a bid in our auction will be offered the opportunity to go on a free camping experience with them in the Antarctic. How amazing would that be? So there really is something for everyone in the auction. There's even a absolutely humongous uh, giant plush penguin. <laughs> but it's going to be fun trying to post that to you. So, you know, challenge us. Uh, so head over to the auction site and get bidding. It should all be a lot of fun. Uh, thank you so much, all of the speakers and uh, all of our viewers. Goodbye from me for now. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah, cheerio. <laughs>